what is the context of our meeting today? It is Zimbabwe in transition. Zimbabwe has been in transition for a very long time. The recent background is the warning we gave some of us as people seized with the Zimbabwe situation that Zimbabwe was heading for a hard landing. Then the coup came in November 2017. As we have argued, this was a stage in the disintegration of the Mugabe Nangagwa regime. And regrettably, we've been proved right. Since 2017, the decline has been rapid politically and economically. On the eve of, our, of this meeting, with one of the most dramatic of press conferences yesterday, where infighting has begun within the regime itself, with a whole security sector mobilized to deny that there is a, a rumors about an imminent coup. And along with it, a dismissal of what they termed the National Transition Authority. It, for us, the National Transition Authority is meant, as Tony Rila will explain later, was meant as a stopgap in the face of a collapsing government, a state no longer able to effect political, no economic reforms, and therefore the need for the country to have a stopgap measure in the form of a transitional government made of non-partisan Patriots, about whom all parties agree as being the best people to steer the country before the next elections. And in particular, to return the country to constitutional rule, including the return of the military to the barracks, a democratic order in the form of an accountable executive, a vibrant legislature, and a fiercely independent judiciary. On the, as a basis for economic recovery, which can't begin without a political settlement. And the need to mobilize the diaspora, as is known now, 70%, 70 to 75% of professional and skilled Zimbabweans are outside the country, including many of those on the panel tonight. So what do we have to do now is the question. And for that, we have a panel led by our able moderator, Valid Gonda, Zimbabwean independent journalist and president of women in radio and television. Valid needs no introduction. She has chaired many of such sessions and we are pleased that she's here just through this, this occasion. We have Tony Rila, who's our rapporteur. Tony Rila is from the Platform for Concerned Citizens, a co-convener with me. Uh, an active activist, many years standing, and one who has been a moving force in the kind of conversation we're having this evening. I have not seen yet, uh, we have the political parties. Thank you. We are supposed to have Gladys Sachwayo uh, from the MDC Alliance. I hope she joins us shortly. Uh, we'll otherwise, we won't hear. Oh, okay. So yeah. just leave it. And you have two more introductions. Yeah. We also have Noah Manika from a Build Zimbabwe Alliance. We are meant to have uh, Victor Matema Danda from ZANU PF. I, we had invited Patrick Shinamasa in the first instance as a spokesman for ZANU PF, and he nominated. Victor Matima Danda. We hope you'll join us later. We also invited Cooper's uh, group and she nominated Priscilla Missy I hope she joins us shortly. The main political parties, uh, the others are really coming from civic society in the, an academia, Jonathan Moyo. Um, Eleanor Susulu from South Africa, Zimbabwe, and my niece too. 
Kenneth Mtata, an emergent voice in Zimbabwean civic politics, is with the ZCC, but also our General Secretary of the National Convergence Platform. I have already referred to Brian Raftopoulos, a leading Zimbabwean academic, a civic leader, regrettably out there too in the diaspora. Uh, Shingim Nyeza belongs to no party, but he has been at the center of the storm, the eye of the storm recently, as you hear from himself. We have Godfrey Zenangamu, and really recently a prominent youth leader in Zanupia. He will tell us shortly where he belongs now. Uh, <coughs> Sipo Malunga, who I call Sydney after his father, very able lawyer, brilliant writer, and has been making very important um, interventions in the Zimbabwean process. We also have others on the sidelines, um, Kasukwere, Xavier Kasukwere, Tendai Biti, Rosana Moyo, uh, Alex Magaisa, uh, Simba Makoni, Dumusani uh, Muleya, Aline Petras, Tendai Dubuchena, and many others. Godric Anyenze, whom you heard, uh, and Briggs Bomba, to name only a few. We really hope uh, this, that we will have a, a useful discussion. In particular, it's not just Terry, about discussion. I'm actually it's about, on the conference call now. It, okay, it, we, have to decide, we have to decide this evening uh, what would be the way forward, what is to be done now. And so this might just be the first in such conversations. So now I hand over to, to Violet to take up the show. Violet. Thank you very much, Dr. Ibo Mandaza, for the introductions and mapping out the purpose of today's SAPIS Trust Policy Dialogue on Zimbabwe's deepening crisis. The main issue we want to tackle is on the way forward for Zimbabwe, as you've heard from uh, Dr. Mandaza. We already know the problems we are facing and we have quite a number of speakers today. So I'm going to ask everyone to be short and to the point and address the main issue, which is what we have to do right now. To our viewers, we would like to hear your thoughts on this. You can get in touch by using the hashtag ZimWayForward, that's hashtag ZimWayForward, or follow SAPES on Facebook where we are also live streaming. Throughout the program, we will do our best, time permitting, to take comments and questions from social media platforms. And to those following on Zoom and would like to ask questions directly, please raise your hands and we will try and get a few of you to contribute. Our format will be slightly different today to ensure that as many people contribute as possible. So we're going to ask panelists to be short and to the point and keep their responses less than three minutes long. My colleague and fellow journalist, Michelle Hakata, will be the rapporteur and uh, timekeeper. She will remind us on the Zoom chat if we are going over allocated time. And uh, also before we start, I just wanted to let everyone know, especially those who've just joined us, that uh, we are having some problems as uh, some trolls are invading our space and also just um, um, you know, playing music. So this is going to happen uh, throughout the course of the evening. So we apologize for that. We'll try and delete uh, as soon as we um, get any of these uh, disruptions. With, uh, so from now on, I'm just going to go straight into it because we have a lot to discuss and so many people we need to hear from. Let me start with uh, Pastor Shingi Munyeza. Pastor Munyeza, as a member of the Presidential Advisory Committee or PAC and a man of God, what do you think should be happening now or should happen now? Pastor Munyeza. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> uh, thanks very much, Violet. Um, I would like to have a disclaimer here. I'm not here as a Presidential Advisory Council member. Uh, there is a different protocol for that. <clears throat> so I come here as a citizen and um, in my own personal capacity. Uh, obviously, gathering experiences from all over as a pastor in the church, as an entrepreneur, as a philanthropist, um, and all those put together. So um, I would like to just be very brief. I think I've got, what, two, three minutes? How much do I have? 
Yeah, two and a half minutes now. Okay, <laughs> two and a half minutes. <laughs> um, we, we have a crisis. Uh, we are facing a storm. We are facing uh, what I term a state failure, which was a progression from state capture to state abuse. Now we're going into state failure where the state cannot provide, cannot protect, and also cannot uh, lead uh, or pro, um, lead us into prosperity where we can do what we need so that the country is vibrant and we are a prosperous nation. And, and with that, we have a few things that are beginning to take place. Number one, we have COVID-19. We have uh, food insecurity. We have um, bad or rather a dearth of leadership. We have uh, economic collapse. We have um, uh, collapse in service delivery. Uh, so we have all these that are now what I would term as the a, a perfect storm. So over the next few weeks, not even months, uh, the nation is going to have to grapple with this. Um, so what do we need to do? First and foremost, the nation needs a soft landing. We're going to hit a brick wall very badly. Our coronavirus um, uh, infections are going up by the day. Um, uh, food insecurity, people are starving. So we need a soft landing uh, where we will need to apply some breaks to this crush that we're going to have. We're going to crush. It's going to be painful. Um, as this can be seen, the currency is no longer existing. So once that soft landing is given, we basically need a transitional um, uh, period where we need to deal with our underlining foundational uh, values and governance processes. Uh, which must first of all deal with issue of healing, um, truth, and reconciliation. So that's number one that we need to tackle because we are, we've been unable to talk to one another because we are bitter, we are angry, we've got bad governance system. And then um, the next thing that needs to happen is obviously to, to start working on um, on freedoms, um, you know, your rights and freedoms to be given back to the people. Now we don't have them. Whatever we have, we have to fight for it, uh, even though it's in the constitution. So, and then the next thing has to be the issue of reforms um, across the board, but also uh, more underlining reforms such as the electoral reforms, so that we will be able to have elections that are free, fair and credible, but more importantly, that are not contested in terms of the result. So far, all our election result has always been contested. So we need to prepare the, the country back to that proper governance where we are, we are living in harmony and in peace. Now, what do we let need me, to do? Let me, let me just, let me just uh, interrupt. Sorry for interrupting you there, but I just need uh, to, to, to ask uh, uh, this question. I know you said you, you, you're not speaking on behalf of PAC, but you are still uh, in PAC. And, uh, and a lot of people will be asking that you're making a lot of noise outside. But w why is that? What's going on? As, as, as a presidential advisor, are you able to also, because I've seen some um, uh, recordings where, um, you know, people have been asking that, why are you, who exactly are you attacking when you're actually one of the advisors in, 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 for, uh, for the president? So what was it as a presidential advisor that led you to the point to accept that the current crop of leadership will never get us to where we need to be as a nation? First and foremost, because of our bad governance system, we believe that those who advise must not talk anymore. And that's the point I'm trying to make, Violet. The point I'm making is that, first of all, I'm an advisor, I'm not employed, I'm not paid, I'm not elected. I don't have any benefits. I speak my mind out as far as how I've been speaking. In fact, if you trace me from since I've been made an advisor, I have even made more criticism about this system, right up to the abductions, right up to this. So it doesn't mean that if you're, not, if you're an advisor, you should then shut up and not speak your mind. I have a mind of my own. As a pastor, 
I don't always have to share what the congregants come and share with me in private and I counsel with them. But it doesn't mean I mustn't preach what the word of God says. But I understand where you're coming from and I understand where we're coming from as a people. It is because we are so toxic and polarized that we think if you're on that side, you can also be this side. Uh, and there is no, you are, it's, a, it's, a bina, it's a binary thinking, it's a polarized environment, it's toxic. We need to break that up. That there are some things that even husband and wife can disagree, but they mustn't go for a divorce. I guess quite a few people, uh, Mr. Mies, uh, quite a few people will be curious to know why you remain in the pack. And even in the chats there, I can see uh, Dr. Frank Bunu is asking, why don't you resign? So people are curious why you remain in the pack and uh, uh, when you're so critical. Yes. Um, if I'm critical about my congregants, do I resign as a pastor? I just want to ask back. Because they, I, I'm trying to, there's a value that we have lost. The value we have lost is that if you disagree with something, you must leave. Remember that Zimbabwe is owned by Zimbabweans. Government is owned by Zimbabweans. And at the end of the day, whatever role, that's why we've lost so much capital in terms of human capital, because people leave part of state or say, look, it's so rotten, I don't want to be part of it. It's so rotten, I don't want to be part of it. When are we going to fix this thing here now? The idea is to portray that we have now left this thing here to either a rogue operation because we all run away from it and say, look, it's too bad. I don't want to be part of it. Now, it's different to be part of it and compromise your position. Now, I'm not compromising my position. I'm not corrupt because if I was, there'll be debt out there. Okay, so last question so that I can move to the next um, uh, 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 speaker. Vusimusi Sibanda asks, may the pastor uh, tell us the nature of the discussions during these meetings and what has been the attitude of the government during these discussions? Are you able to tell us anything about that? I've just told you, Violet, and unfortunately, I understand where everybody comes from. Everybody is toxic right now. I cannot talk about something that I discuss with my flock on a personal level as a pastor. I cannot talk about it in public. Now, because I'm an advisor, I am not a paid official. I am not an elected official. If I was elected, I would be able to tell you everything because I would be representing a constituency. Okay, no, thank you very much, uh, Mufundisi Mieza. Let me go to Gladys Tlachwayo from the MDC. Uh, Gladys, are you there? Hi, Gladys. I thought I saw Gladys Tlachwayo earlier. Yes, I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, welcome, uh, Gladys. Um, let me go straight into it. How do you respond to critics who say the opposition has lost the ethos of the struggle? Uh, I would definitely disagree uh, from that analysis. Um, as the Movement for Democratic Change Alliance, we have always been driven by our values. Um, we are a social democratic uh, party. We believe in solidarity. We believe in equality. We believe in justice. We believe in democracy. Those are the ethos that uh, drive us as a movement. Um, and if you look at what is happening um, in present day Zimbabwe, you'd actually see that you know, we are being targeted on the basis of those ethos. If you look at how the military is being dispatched um, you know, to take our assets, to dismember our organization, our political party, um, if you look at how state institutions are being used um, to dismember our party, you actually see that that is happening on the basis that we are sticking um, to our ethos and our values. Um, it is really unfortunate that we are having this conversation uh, on what we need to do as um, Zimbabwe at a very difficult time. Um, and I think we also appeal to Zimbabweans to understand that the current attack on the MDC Alliance is not an attack on the MDC Alliance per se, but it's actually an attack on democracy, which is why it's important for all of us, I mean, Zimbabweans to come together and to think through what we need to do 
We have always emphasized uh, as the MDC Alliance that the nature, uh, because I think, uh, uh, Violet, it's important for us to discuss the nature of the crisis in Zimbabwe before we even talk about solutions. Because if we do not agree on the nature of the Zimbabwean crisis, it will be very difficult to agree on the, you know, on the solutions. We have always submitted as the MDC Alliance that what we have in Zimbabwe is a political crisis. We have a political, we have a, a crisis of governance, a crisis of leadership, um, a crisis of uh, legitimacy born out of a coup, uh, but also born out of, um, you know, um, successive uh, disputed elections, including the 2018 election. So you have input legitimacy uh, born out of uh, processes that are not democratic, um, but that has also led to output legitimacy in okay, terms so of Gladys, uh, performance. So Gladys, let me just uh, um, uh, ask you a question. In fact, let me go to No Mutasa, who asks that um, the NDC alliance is clearly on a back foot and reeling under illegal onslaught and physical persecution at the hands of the combined um, renegade uh, MDCT and ZANU PF. This is what he says. So he's asking, is there still a strategy and a think tank on a way out? In particular, where is the battle for electoral reforms before 20, 2023? Um, definitely, there is a strategy. Um, I like, you know, the analysis that was given by the person who gave that question, uh, because clearly what we are fighting, you know, is a ZANU-PF system. We are fighting, um, you know, ZANU-PF is trying to hijack our political party. That's what is happening. Uh, let's not even talk about, you know, the Toko Coupes. Let's not even talk about uh, the Douglas Monzora. It is ZANU-PF and Mr. Emerson Mnangagwa who are trying to destroy uh, the legitimate, uh, the authentic opposition in Zimbabwe. And they are trying to drive um, Zimbabwe into a, into a, a, a one-party state. Um, so as the MDC Alliance, we are quite clear in terms of what we are fighting. Um, and it is on that basis that we, we, we are confronting the Emerson Mnangagwa regime, um, you know, asking critical questions. Uh, uh, we, 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 we understand that, you know, in 2023, we are going to be having elections. And um, if you still remember, um, you know, um, early on in the year, we launched what we call uh, PRIZE, which is basically our principles for, you know, uh, democratic elections, where we were, you know, um, outlining what needs to be done in order to have um, a democratic elections. So we have not uh, reneged on that, on that fight. Um, in fact, uh, we, you know, at the beginning of the year, we also rolled out, you know, our five big fights. Uh, basically, you know, outlining our agenda as a political party in 2020, and those five fights, you know, spoke to, you know, a fight for a people's government. Um, and definitely, this speaks to, you know, electoral issues, making sure that, you know, we put in place the electoral reforms that are needed to make sure that we we put an end. Um, to disputed elections, we spoke to you know a fight for livelihood and di dignity, you know a fight for rule of law and human rights, a fight for constitutionalism, as well as a fight for 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 I mean against corruption. So we are very much aware of um, uh, 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 we are very much you know uh, glued in in terms of the issues that uh, you know uh, uh, the Zimbabwean people are facing that we are facing as a movement, which is why we put out these uh, five big fights in order to you know, push the democratic struggle and the struggle you know, for, 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 for a democratic um, development of state in Zimbabwe. So what is the MDC Alliance position on a proposed GNU or NTA? Um, if you still remember, Violet, we have what we call a uh, reload. We have always insisted as the MDC uh, Alliance that Zimbabwe needs to reload. Um, and, you know, we launched our reload, which is basically Zimbabwe's roadmap to economic recovery, legitimacy, openness, um, and democracy. Um, obviously, you know, informed by the nature of the crisis that I spoke to earlier on, that we have a political crisis. And that uh, roadmap gives five critical, um, you know, steps that are necessary to reload uh, Zimbabwe. The first step being political and diplomatic pressure, uh, and also advocacy. You know, mobilization of all pro democracy, uh, pro democracy forces, all progressive forces, um, to have to build, you know, a national consensus 
on the way forward. So this very platform is very important for us to, you know, um, uh, build that broad based, you know, uh, platform where we actually, you know, agree on what needs to be done and be able to, to move forward. So that is the first uh, uh, stage that we need to, um, you know, um, we need to attend to. We then said uh, we also need national dialogue, national dialogue that is credible, that is bankable, that is legitimate, uh, and, and also guaranteed by the international community with specific deliverables and timeframes, um, and also facilitated by a you know, mutually agreed uh, facilitator. So that's the second okay. step. All right, we'll, we'll stop it for, for, for now and then we can always come back. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gladys. Now, uh, let me, we, we, as uh, Dr. Mandaza uh, pointed out right at the beginning, we did reach out to Zona PF to join the discussion. And uh, Mr. Patrick Chinamasa had recommended the party's uh, Victor Matemadanda, but he has withdrawn at the last minute. But we do have Godfrey Senangamu, who is a former Zanu PF Youth League a political commissar, who was recently fired from the party after he said that Zanu PF was captured and uh, named, named some corrupt officials. Godfrey, are you online? Yes, my sister, how are you? I'm good, and I hope you're well. Let me go straight into it. Um, who do you think is the impediment to reforms? Okay, firstly, I would want to say, uh, I think uh, our politicians are an impediment to, to reforms. Our politicians from across the political uh, divide. Wh why I say so, my sister, it is because, uh, obviously, ZANU-PF would not want to reform itself out of power. But uh, the major opposition party, which is the MDC, had an opportunity when they were part of uh, the inclusive government between 2009 and uh, 2013, where, where we also managed to come up with a new constitution for, for Zimbabwe. And they were part of the government. Why didn't they push for the electoral reforms when they were in government? and when they had a stake in, in the governance of the country. And, and at one point, they had a majority in parliament. Like in 2008, ZANU-PF had a minority in parliament, though they had a president. The MDC had, had a majority. So our politicians are, no, are not sincere. These are just political games that they continue to play and, and, and mind games that they continue to play on us. They are not sincere, and in my view, they are the impediment and the first problem that we have to solve as Zimbabweans if we are ever to achieve anything on the political arena. So, so what do we need to do now? What is the way forward in your view? Uh, as for me, what I would think is uh, we cannot continue to rely on, 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 on a few people who, uh, who have taken politics as a, as a career. People who have turned themselves from leaders into looters, from uh, messengers into mercenaries, from lawyers into liars, from uh, democrats into dictators, and from revolutionaries into reactionaries. We have to take uh, the power back to, to the people, to the citizens. Because in my view, uh, we, we, we have not more than 2,400 uh, politicians who occupy offices from the presidium uh, up to down to where, where you have a councillor, you have three in the presidium, plus or minus thirty uh, in 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 cabinet, two hundred ten elected MPs. Uh, you have uh, sixty proportional representation MPs. You have uh, sixty senators and around one thousand nine hundred eighty-five uh, councillors, and there are not more than two thousand four hundred. So how can we have uh, progress when plus or minus eight million adults continue to rely? On, on what a, a, a minority have to say. We have to go back to the people, uh, educate the people, uh, teach them on what is at stake, uh, make them understand and be part of the greater movement that will seek uh, change, uh, positive change in Zimbabwe. That's my view, my dear sister. And what did you make of the um, press conference by the JOC uh, last night? And do you think that the military should be part of these discussions on the way forward? Yeah, uh, I would not have wanted to, to pass a comment on, on security matters because 
I'm not an expert, but since you have uh, posed that question, I'll give you my personal view and opinion over, over the matter. One, we have to understand uh, the relationship between uh, ZANU-PF and the military. Uh, as much as I you know, I think it goes back to uh, the liberation struggle, where when they had a leadership crisis, uh, the military officers who were stationed at Mgagao had to come in and, and, and uh, bring in a leader in the form of Mugabe after displacing uh, the late Ndabaningi Stole. That was in 1970, that was in 1975, 76, and uh, till uh, when Zanpef had a conference, their congress in 1977 in Chimoyo. And that, that must give people a clear picture as to the relationship of, of the military to, to ZANU-PF. And when we had a challenge in 2017, when all of us wanted Mugabe to, to, to leave, uh, you, you all know what, what happened. We had uh, Operation Resole Gassi, uh, where, where we had uh, the military guys coming in to assist, and then, we had, and then a civilian face was brought in to sanitize everything. Uh, so if we are to say we don't want the military, we have to bear that in mind because uh, that, that is what makes up the ZANU-PF and the military uh, relationship. And now coming back to, to, to your question as to the statement that was uh, say, uh, given out yesterday can by... Make, can you make it brief, just in 30 seconds? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, th th that's okay. For me, I don't think that there is any problem in involving the military in, 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 in what has to, to happen in Zimbabwe. Because at the end of the day, whatever, whatever stupid decision that politicians make, we have an impact on, on, on the defense and security uh, situation in the country. And these are citizens. Why should we run away from them? If, when, when, when we celebrated their, their intervention in 2017, the MDC and the ZANU-PF celebrated their intervention. And what is the problem today when, when, the, the, when someone says, no, they must be involved? I don't think they must be involved in, in, in like having a coup or something. But as a critical stakeholder of Zimbabwe, yes, they must be involved just like anyone else. They must be part of the conversation. They must be part of any arrangement that is to come. That is if we are to come up with anything sustainable. They are not enemies to the people. They serve us, they are our defense, they are our security. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let me go to the General Secretary of the Zimbabwe Council of Churches, Reverend Kenneth Mutata. Reverend Mutata, what should be the church's response in terms of the way forward? We're just waiting for Reverend Mutata's mic. Can we unmute his mic, please? Yes, th thank you very much, uh, Violet, and uh, good evening, colleagues. Uh, I think uh, we, we know that uh, the... Uh, sorry, there, there is someone on the screen there. Okay, we can hear you. We can see you. You can go ahead. Oh, that's, that's fine. Uh, I, uh, what I was saying is that uh, the church has uh, already made their proposals of uh, how the church could come out of, uh, the nation could come out of its logjam. First, uh, we need to, to recognize that uh, the current uh, political establishment, both in the ruling party and the opposition, are not able to take the, the country out of the current mess uh, for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is there is too much at stake. There is fear for those who are accused of committing human rights violations, that if the day they are no longer in power, they are going to be put in prison. And for this reason, there is no way they will be willing uh, to uh, uh, relinquish power. The second reason is that those who are in the opposition are not managing to mobilize the whole nation to follow the proposition they are giving as an alternative to the current establishment. So what we find ourselves in at the moment is we find ourselves in a logjam, and that's why the church proposed. What we need is we need an arrangement uh, where we are going to uh, provide a temporary 
a transitional mechanism, whichever name we call, uh, uh, others have called it the, transi the National Transitional Authority, whatever structures that people may come up with. What we need is we need a moment, a sabbatical period, where the nation is going to reboot and reset itself. And it will be characterized by a number of things. First, the nation must be able to deal with the heads of the past which have not been resolved. That go back to more than 40 years, but that have been characterized by Gukura Hundi and the other most recent uh, uh, issues. We need to find a way of resolving those. Secondly, we need to implement the constitution. Number three, we need to establish a new social contract that is based on an inclusive uh, economy and get rid of this corruption and the cartel economy that is dominating the economy now. Number four, we must establish a new international re-engagement uh, mechanism framework in which all citizens are participating. Number five, we need to establish a, an inclusive humanitarian intervention mechanism so that we feed our people who are currently hungry, uh, recover uh, the health and education systems and all the social services. We believe that this uh, moment of transition will allow uh, for the nation uh, uh, to restore itself and, and therefore uh, whenever there is an opportunity to, for democratic competition, uh, it will be fair, it will be transparent, uh, and it will be accountable. This is the proposition that the church uh, has made and the church has said it is not able to achieve this only as a church and therefore has invited uh, uh, civil society. And that's why uh, now we have the establishment of the uh, National uh, 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 Convention, uh, which has uh, put together the platform uh, that brings together civil society, business, uh, churches, uh, to try and see how the nation could be mobilized to one common platform. That, that's what I was actually going to ask, that um, in the past, the church seemed to have uh, difficulties getting people together. So is this what you're going to be doing differently now by this convention that you're talking about? Or there's more that, that, you also, um, that you're also going to be doing? The National Convergence Platform is already a very credible platform, which was launched in December 2019, which is represented by uh, most of the apex bodies of civil society. Uh, many of the key uh, professional bodies are now part. It has just held its uh, summit uh, in the last two weeks, and it is in a process now to go back to the constituency to mobilize uh, different sectors uh, of society, to reach out to Zimbabweans who are in the diaspora, to reach out to local uh, communities so that local communities can be structured in this kind of uh, conversation uh, and mobilization. We think that we are in the right, on the right track if I listened to the previous uh, speaker, I think this is the, uh, the journey that we think we are on. We cannot relinquish our future to a few political actors who are not finding a way to build consensus. And therefore, we need to build consensus among Zimbabweans so that we can move uh, together uh, uh, as a nation. Okay, so let me go. Thank you very much, Reverend Mutata. Let, let me go to Justina Mukoko, a human rights activist and director of the Zimbabwe Peace Project. First of all, Justina, what do you make of what uh, Reverend Mutata has uh, put forward? We're just waiting for Justina. Can we unmute your mic, please, Justina? We can't hear you. Okay. Yes. My apologies about that. Thank you very much. Um, I think what uh, Reverend Mutata has spoken about, we recognize that um, the National Convergence Platform is a platform that could bring us together. Uh, because I think um, under that banner, we have been able to identify what the challenges are that Zimbabweans are facing. And we think that we need to be able to go back to the constituencies that we represent so that we hear their voices and their voices can actually be um, brought up for everyone to be able to hear what people are saying. And uh, I think at this particular moment, what we are also as civil society concerned about 
is the issue around the constitutional amendments that have been proposed. And um, I think as civil society, we feel that um, it seems that there is a rush. And now we are being told that um, public hearings are starting on Monday. But we have lockdown regulations where people are not supposed to be more than 50 in one gathering. And uh, looking at the places where the teams are going, going to go, it's only 18 uh, places that they are going to go. And if we say 50 people in each of those places, it means that they are only going to reach out to 900 people. But we also don't have confirmation that everybody will be able to get to those venues as a result of um, the enforcement of the lockdown regulations where a lot of people, even with exemption letters, have been turned back. And we actually feel that it is really um, stealing from the Zimbabwean citizens in terms of the constitutional amendments because when we went for the referenda, there are things that we agreed to. And looking at the raft of the amendments, we feel that some of the amendments, some of the sections of the constitution have not even been tried out. So what is the rush in terms of us wanting to have um, those changes? But what is the way forward, especially from the civil society? I think the way forward for us is that um, we really want to listen to what is happening in, um, in a lot of places at the moment. I think if we are getting information right from the constituencies that we are representing, we are worried about um, violations that citizens are experiencing at the hands of uh, security forces who are um, enforcing the lockdown uh, regulations. We have had people who have lost their lives as a result of um, the treatment that they have received at the hands of um, uh, security forces. And we feel that the way to go is that people's rights have to be um, respected. It doesn't matter that we have COVID-19, um, people's rights still need to be, um, to be respected and we need to be able to get back to the rule of law. And those are some of the things that are kind of uh, concerning us at this particular time. And also issues around the abductions and torture that um, we have been talking about in the, in the last few weeks. So uh, the final question uh, uh, for, for, for you, Justina, how do you respond to people? And I'm just going through some of the chats that, uh, you know, people are sick and tired of talk shops, you know, of workshops, of presses, of reports and conferences. Uh, what more can we get from the civil society that's just not talk shops and just, uh, you know, the same things um, that people keep hearing about? I think people might not be aware in terms of the work that civil society is actually involved in. We work in communities, we mobilize um, people in different um, places, and um, we have had people respond to um, a lot of situations that have uh, taken place, and also having people also speak their mind in terms of issues of healing, issues of reconciliation, because they feel that they have, um, they actually have scars that are still new that need to be, um, to be healed. So we actually go beyond uh, just meeting in workshops, but also having significant meetings with uh, communities and also having things that are tangible that are happening. I can actually speak about some of the things um, in terms of structures that have been established in communities where we continue to look at how the girl child is disadvantaged and we have structures that are going after um, girls who are being taken into early marriage. Okay, no, thank you. So let me go to uh, Michelle Hakata. Michelle? As a journalist, what needs to happen now in the media space? Michelle, your mic is... Yeah, can you start again? 
Your mic, your mic is off. Yes, uh, can you hear me now, Violet? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay, government needs to do more to open up the media space, in particular in broadcasting, where we have only one TV channel. Now, um, in Southern Africa, we are, we're the first country to have um, TV in 1960, after Nigeria. But today, we only have, we'll still have ZPC, and we own, the only other channels are actually online, which, is, which makes it difficult for people to access because of the very, very high data costs. So the first now is to allow other players into the broadcast sector. ZPC has been a monopoly for the longest time. And I think Zimbabweans are exhausted and I think they need some more variety. We need to let the broadcast media flourish and other people actually step into the media space. So for me, really the, 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 the problem is the barriers to entry to broadcasting. It's very expensive to go into the broadcast sector in Zimbabwe. There are huge fees that you must pay there, there, there are also things that you have to pay to get into, into that space. So government needs to do more to allow the media to grow, to allow the media to flourish. Is, Zimb is, is journalism still a safe space in Zimbabwe? Well, journalism is under siege right now. Um, Violet, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay, there's, there's a hacker there, but but if you can hear me and see me, it's we've fine. Just, we've just deleted the... Okay, name. journalism is a profession under siege. Um, journalists get arrested, get harassed, get trolled, especially on social media. Social media has brought with it, you know, many advantages for Zimbabweans uh, because of the, the, the amount of things that we can do on these spaces. But then for many, it's also a place where people are trolled, where people are abused. We've had a lot of revelations in the press recently about corruption. Those journalists who are making those reservations are not, are, not, are not safe. They can be arrested and they're actually worried about their security. Now, I know that some, there will be more revelations in the coming days from, uh, the, from a couple of journalists in this country. I worry that they, their lives will not be safe. So journalism has become something, something of, a, of, a, of a difficult profession. So I think there's need to protect journalists. And there's also need to have um, some kind of fund to promote investigative journalism because it's very difficult and it's very expensive to have investigative journalists. But as, as we have seen in recent days, it's been very exciting to see what this, these journalists have come up with. So there's need again for, to, for the government again to allow the media to do their work and to step back and stop intimidating journalists and, and going into their spaces with intimidation. Okay, no, th thank you very much, um, Michelle. I'm just checking to see if um, Dr. Noah Manika, Manika is back online and uh, Professor Jonathan Moyo, if they're back online. Is Dr. Manika online? Manika is in, yes. Call on him. Dr. Manika Murikoere. You have to unmute your mic. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll come back to Dr. Manika. Let me go to Sipo Malunga. Sipo, you're there? There's so many people online, I can't tell if Sipo's there. I'm here, Violet, yes. Okay, your thoughts, Asipo, in terms of what you've been hearing so far and what you view as the way forward? Uh, thank you very much, Violet. Uh, I think that uh, we, 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 we need to agree on a number of things. The first is that uh, we do not have a state. We do not have a government that is serving the interest of the people. We have a small elite that has captured the state, that has captured all its institutions, that has captured the economy, that is utilizing this capture for personal benefit. This has been going on for a long time. It's not new. They have insulated themselves with institutions, with a party first, with the military around that, with the judiciary, 
with electoral commissions, with everything that is designed to maintain this charade of a state serving the people. It's nonsense. It has never done that. It's not doing that. So let us not lie to ourselves and start off assuming that these people are working in the public interest. They are not. They never have. So, 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 so what do you want to see happening then? They need to go. Once we accept that they are not there operating in the interest of the people, the people need to take back their stake. How? They need to reclaim their power. Now, how? Good question. The people are not able to reclaim the state using the institutions that this elite has controlled and controls. There has to be something different. People go to vote, elections are stolen. People go to court, judges are put there and they are impartial. So people need to claim back their power. Ultimately, all power belongs to the people. How will the people do this? There are so many ways. And we have seen it happen in other places before. It is possible for people to demand that the, part, the, the whole government resigns. They can demand the resignation of the government. The government must go. We want the government to go so that we put in place a government that will serve us. It is not the first time this has happened. It has happened in Sudan. It has happened in Egypt. It has happened in Tunisia. It has happened in Burkina Faso. It has happened in Ukraine. When the institutions fail the people, the people must take back their power. So, so uh, Yvonne Gwashawan is saying she agrees with you, but still the question is what catalyst can be used to get the people to reclaim their political power? Look, I, I really have no, I, I, I don't believe that Zimbabweans must wait for a messiah. What did he take in Tunisia? A vendor was selling goods in the streets. He felt aggrieved. He set himself alight. This is an ordinary man. It could be anybody in Baram Sika. He's so aggrieved. He's hungry. He's got no money for his family. He's devastated. He decides, I'm going to set myself ablaze. And the people were so enraged with that. And they, within a month, Ben Ali had run away and hidden in Canada. What happened in Tahir Square in Egypt? And I'm not even saying people should do that or should do this. People should not expect Nelson Chamisa to lead them out of this. People should not expect the military to lead them out of this. They should not expect ZANU PF youth to lead them out of this. They should not expect ZANU to implode and lead them out of this. Something will give, and we won't know where it's coming from. I wrote an article last week where I say it's a matter of time before the people claim back their power. I don't know when that is going to be, and nobody knows. But when that happens, I can assure you that when the people make the decision that enough is enough, they will take back their power. Unfortunately, it can be bloody. It can be chaotic. For me, the only question is this. When people do decide to claim back their power, because the ruling party also controls the coercive instruments of power, which is the military and the police, my only hope is this, that the military will use that opportunity to make the right decision. Even though up until today, they have been part of ZANU-PF and this elite, because the generals are part of this elite that I'm talking, about, I'm talking about, it is still possible for the military to make the right decision. In other countries, where people have decided at some point to take back their power, the military has tried to push back against the people, but at some point, sense has prevailed, and the military has realized that the side it must take is the people's side. Because when the people fight, they are ready and willing to push out the military as well. And that is a fact. So at some point, I'm hoping that everybody's sitting down and thinking very seriously. We're hearing a coup, maybe there's a coup, maybe there's a... I don't really care if the ZANU-PF remove themselves because at the end of the day, they removed Mugabe. So if they remove themselves, who cares? It's a charade. Okay. Nobody... Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, 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 Sipo Malunga from South Africa. Um, Dr. Noah Manika, I understand you're back online? Yeah, I was actually online 
uh, when when you were looking for me, I, I was listening to everything that was said before. Okay, how are you doing in America doing, there? Doing well, uh, we're doing well. Okay, great. So let me go straight into it. I'm, I'm sure you've been following what's been, hap what was, what's been said. Do we need a mediated political settlement or national dialogue right now in Zimbabwe? Well, uh, let me just really comment real quick on what I've heard other people saying. Look, we have all failed, all of us. And I, I think this uh, idea that one section uh, of the uh, population has failed more than others is simply not true. And every generation has failed. And uh, it, this is something that we have to really uh, own as a people. And I think that's where we must all begin. I lived in Romania between 1982 and 1985, uh, when Romania was under one of the worst dictators uh, in, the, in the world. And uh, I remember when I left thinking, there is no way things are going to change uh, in Romania. But they did change in 1989. And why did they change? Because the wall of protection around the minority that actually oppresses the majority of the people started to crumble. And I think we need to be honest about what constitutes that uh, wall of protection. That wall of protection in Zimbabwe also includes uh, you know, young people who are drawn into the military, the people who you see actually firing those, those guns and uh, putting their uh, boots on the necks of people are people mostly born after 19, 1980. Uh, so I, I think it's time for us to begin to say these things as they are. When I say it in 2016, when I started uh, really openly um, uh, canvassing for change in Zimbabwe, I say that it's time for young people in the military to begin to disobey illegal orders. There is nothing treasonous about that. If you read our constitution, it clearly says that the military must not be used for partisan uh, purposes. And it's time for us to recognize that it's not treasonous for people to disobey Ill illegal orders. And you know, when, when you have, uh, one of the things that I, 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 I'm usually in, invited on such platforms and sometimes I'm kind of like leery of uh, participating because a lot of times our discussions devolve to a discussion of public policy. And we as Zimbabweans, we, you know what, we are so educated that we can spend the next 20 years talking about public policy. But really what we need to talk about is how we can empower everybody to no longer protect the minority interests of people. And you look at people who are in the civil service right now, uh, think about this. If you joined the civil service in 1980 and you were 25 years old, you're 65 and you're most probably going to die in poverty. And it is your responsibility, whether you are a judge or whether you are a diplomat, whoever you are, to understand that change is in your uh, interest. And so I really believe that it is time for all of us to start messaging our relatives, the people in our churches, people of our generation, all, everybody, that ch change needs to happen now. Let me say this. So, so Dr. Manika, what should be done and by who, how, and when? Can, by by can, all of us. It, it, this how? is something. This it's, is, not, something. it's not that easy to just say by all of us. We know no, it is. Specifics. It's, it's specifically because we think it's not that easy that we don't do it. It is time for you, Violet, to be talking to people in your family, if there's some people in your family who are in the military, to actually tell them it is legal to disobey a legal order. It's time for pastors, it's time for all of us. And the messaging needs to be that. And this idea, I see this a lot uh, even on social media, people trying to run away from responsibility by pointing fingers at somebody else. If you are a Zimbabwean, you most probably have someone in your family who is involved in protecting Zanupia. And you need to have the courage, whether it's your child, whether it's your church member, whether it's whoever it is, you need to have the courage to actually talk to them about change. There is no change that happens without people rising up and us getting to that uh, point of critical mass where there is so much pressure that the minority, and somebody earlier on mentioned that, the, the number of people who are oppressing Zimbabweans really are a minority. And that has always been the case uh, when you have uh, oppression. And, and until all of us, the majority of the people, start speaking with one voice and saying, this needs to change, things will never change. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Noah Manika, speaking to us from America.
And um, I would like to go to a political analyst and academic Professor Brian Raftopoulos. Prof Raftopoulos? Hello. <coughs> Hi, uh, Hi. Uh, Professor. Is this issue of an NTA or GNU the panacea to the socio-political and economic challenges bedeviling Zimbabwe? Let me, let me go another route for you. Let me say we need to talk about what would be the drivers of change now. And here we need to learn from our history a little bit. In the past, in 1979, in Lancaster, 2007, the GNU, the common denominator was there was some kind of coming together of regional, international, and national forces, which brought people to the table for various reasons. We're at the point now where we not only polarize nationally, but we also polarize again between the region and the international community about Zimbabwe. So the, the thing is that we need to think about very clearly. We're never going to get a total consensus in Zimbabwe. That's not going to happen because there are different, there are different interests at play and those will, be, those will be in place. But you need a sufficient grouping of organizational strength to be pushing for a consistent policy and to be following the, the values of their own party, which the MDC should be doing and which they often have not done but you also need to see what you can do in the region to push the region. The SADC is very weak unless a particular governments take an initiative to push an agenda as South Africa did in 2007, it's not going to move. So our regional linkages to push SADC governments into pressurizing is also a very, very important issue. So unless we can start moving towards not just some kind of national consensus, but bringing regional and international players onto a stage where they can put pressure on the state, on the state which will not move without that pressure. It won't move because at the moment, the opposition is under the greatest pressure it has been since its formation. It's in danger of being seriously disabled before the next election. So moving now in getting the values of the opposition back on uh, in, in line. And this means the opposition is to look very carefully at its own history and what has happened, but also pushing the regional and international dimensions and getting them into some accord on what to do in Zimbabwe. If you rely only on what we can do inside, the, the opposition at the moment, the, 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 the structural weakness of the populace is such that this kind of minimal state which relies on coercion and violence can go on for a long time. We've seen it elsewhere on the continent. You need much more than this. So I think that we need to think carefully about how we bring these different dimensions into play. And that means having a global regional dimension to this particular issue. We, we actually have um, quite a few um, uh, uh, participants in this call from the regional and international uh, community and we'll bring them in uh, to see if they can uh, comment. But um, since they're there, is there anything that you can actually say specifically in terms of what their response should be uh, from the international community, especially SADC and the African Union? SADC and the African Union need to take their values more seriously around human rights abuses, gender abuses, constitutionalism, but they will not do so unless we also make linkages with, with organizations in these countries that can put pressure on those countries, whether it's South Africa, other countries in the region. South Africa at the moment, the ANC is caught in its own factionalism. It doesn't feel confident enough to lead an initiative on Zimbabwe. And so it's very, it's very defensive. It was also, of course, complicit in the 2017 uh, coup. So the Zimbabwe question raises broader issues about governance and about not just in Zimbabwe, but in the region. And which is why some of these governments are so slow to react. We need much more linkages across the region and to, to then say, we as regional, we as the people, this is what we expect from the international community around putting pressure on Zimbabwe. And what sort of pressure from the international community itself? Well, that's, that, I think that's an important thing. We, 
we can't just rely on a sanctions debate. A sanctions debate in the region is not going to work. We need a much more nuanced discussion about what kind of levels of, of understanding of the suffering of the people and how to bring that suffering, uh, uh, get, bring them out of that suffering and not to assume that because people are suffering, they will, there will be a revolution. Suffering uh, can often dis in, disactivate people. So we need to find a much more nuanced discussion on the kind of pressures that we bring, that we ask the international community to bring. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Brian Raftopoulos. Um, and let me see if uh, Bishop Bakare, is Bishop Bakare there or Tendai Biti, Nkosana Moyo, are any of them online? Because I think they were on earlier on. Is Mr. Dr. Nkosana Moyo, are you online? Simba Makoni, Dr. Makoni. Okay, I'll come back. I'll come back to them. Since Professor Brian Raftopoulos has been talking about what the regional and uh, international community should do, let me see if I can get uh, some of the diplomats who are online with us uh, to see if they can talk. Let me start with, um, with the Chinese ambassador or deputy ambassador. Is he online? Mr. Zhao of China. Okay, what about the uh, ambassador, uh, the Swiss ambassador? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I would like to thank uh, SAPES Trust for organizing and convening uh, such an impressive array of panelists. And thank you for the opportunity to say a few words. I think it is clear that this actual situation we are facing, this coronavirus pandemic, has exacerbated the pre-existing structural challenges in many countries. And Zimbabwe is no exception. And this crisis and these challenges involves different levels, political, social, economic, humanitarian, and uh, most likely it impacts the poor uh, the most. No? I think the international community and, and myself, we all have hoped that the pandemic and its consequences would have triggered some efforts towards national cohesion, but it did not happen so far. The past two months have rather led to an increase of tensions and political confrontation, both and foremost domestically, but recently also in relationship with parts of the international community. I think now the moment and this discussion is a testimony to this, I think the moment has come that we have to ask ourselves, should we now allow this coronavirus and this situation to settle scores and fall back to our well-known ideological positions we usually do when we are under pressure? Or should we seek the opportunity to move forward and look for new approaches while acting with restraint? And I believe that now first and foremost, we all have a common interest and this is to see a democratic consolidation process founded on an open and inclusive political and economic dialogue that can bring genuine stability and a peaceful coexistence. But how can we, I think there was a question about this, now what, what, can, what can the international community do? I think my country, like, like also others, we all intend to remain a reliable and progressive partner to the stakeholders. But the stakeholders, they will have to develop on their own a strategic vision towards a national consensus building process. And this will allow the Zimbabweans 
to find uh, among themselves the, the people and the platform. And there might be new people, there might be new platforms, there might be the existing people we know and the, people and the voices we heard that can unite rather than divide. That in the end, a consensus has to be found. And I think the discussion shows that we are heading towards this direction that uh, the time is ripe to engage on this dialogue. Okay. I think this reflects also the opinion of a lot of countries in the region and abroad. Uh, Thank you very much for this opportunity. Much, Ambassador. I understand that uh, de uh, de Chinese Deputy Ambassador Zhao is also online now. Can we unmute his mic? so he can speak. Okay, so probably we're still having technical problems with him. What about the EU ambassador, Timo Okinen? Yes, good evening. Uh, good evening, ambassador. What do you think should happen now for re-engagement in Zimbabwe, with Zimbabwe? Um, well, um, obviously the situation is very complex. And when we are talking about re-engagement and engagement, we are talking about you know, various issues. Uh, we're talking about economic cooperation. We are talking about political cooperation. We are talking about several issues. We are talking about the debt arrears. Um, in the EU circumstances, we are talking about the political dialogue that was recently re-established. Uh, so forth. Uh, so there's, um, you know, several dimensions in, you know, international relations and obviously between different countries and between the EU and Zimbabwe, talking from our own perspective. Um, now, um, I've been now in the country myself for two years. Um, when I came to Zimbabwe, I, I really expected my job description to be a little bit different. Um, right after the 2018 elections. There was a lot of hope and goodwill and expectations that you know, the country would take off in a different kind of a trajectory and we would really be building on uh, you know, boosting our economic relations and trying to find you know, more scope for trade and investment. But, um, but unfortunately, the situation has developed in a, in a different uh, direction and, and so uh, issues such as uh, political political freedoms and rights and, and political relations and, and human rights issues have uh, much been much more dominant for, for obvious reasons because of the developments in the country. So when we are talking about engagement, re-engagement, and for that to happen, um, you're talking about several issues, but they're all connected. Uh, so you're talking about, you know, deeper engagement internationally, you can't separate the economic from the political. So that's why we have to discuss when we are engaging with the government Obviously, we discuss about you know these uh, um, you know uh, issues that we have on on the human rights agenda, on the political agenda, and uh, these need to be tackled. and And you can't separate those from the economic engagement. Um, but now, um, talking about these various issues, um, so we have been quite clear and vocal about our expectations of what should happen. Uh, you know, we have been you know doing these declarations on. Uh, on uh, the recent cases of human rights violations and the expectations that there shouldn't be any impunity and that these, um, uh, these matters need to be tackled. And, and tackled seriously. There's been um, you know, a lot of outstanding issues on the, um, on the political agenda. Uh, we're talking about electoral reforms. We had the EU electoral observation mission. Uh, came up with. A number of I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut you short because on this one we just want to know what the way forward is. So oh, okay. yeah, so so I'm afraid we, because we already know the problems in Zimbabwe. We we want to know the way forward and based also on what Professor Raftopoulos has been saying. So thank you very much uh, for your contribution. Uh, let right, me go. I, I I actually see a, a few uh, hands that have been raised. And I, th and I think uh, I'll go to John Johan, um, who has uh, a contribution to make. John? Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is John Johan. I also represent uh, the Zimbabwe Watchmen uh, in the UK diaspora. I represent Zimbabweans. I'm also a member of the uh, Zimbabwe uh, movement. Um, 
from my perspective, I've got five points to talk about what also can be done um, uh, for Zimbabwe. One, we need to admit that the, we need to make the government admit that we, it has failed, of which we, we all know that it has failed. So we need to raise the agenda towards that failure, which they know. But when we are united enough, we come together, we, we praise that towards them. Two, the opposition, it, it doesn't need to come in as an opposition to actually outwit other political parties that are there. But the opposition should also work with the civic leadership and, and to, uh, in order to progress for change. Three, the civil society, which is the citizens, everybody needs to come together, also pitch in as well and press towards the change. Four, it is the elders uh, of which some of them are here, some are listening, depending where they're coming from, they know the history of the nation. So how do you put pressure on a, a, a Zim sovereignty? It's a, sovereignty, a sovereign state. So put the international community out of it as long as we cannot unite ourselves to say, okay, we have agreed on one, two, three. So Zim as a sovereign state, we need to think of how we can dismantle that sovereignty. One, looking at the constitution. Right now, as we speak, the constitution has been violated. Everything that is happening, if you go back to the constitution on, on how uh, the present government, the leadership, made an oath that it will serve Zimbabwean citizens. It has been violated. That is what we know with the abductions and everything that you can say. So we need to be able to come together and say, okay, this has been violated. So that means that we cannot talk of anything progressing. My, my last point is, my, my last contribution is that we need to be able, as when we come together, offer an exit package for a government like this. A CIPO has already said that it's a cartel that is operating. So it needs an exit package. It needs to be offered, okay, your conditions for the sake of progress, generations have been destroyed. We need to move on as a civil government, a civil society. This is your exit package. What do you say about it? That's all I have to say. A lot has been said, but that's, that's my contribution. Thank you. Thank you. I understand that uh, Professor Jonathan Moyo is back online. Michelle, is that correct? No, I have not seen him, no. I don't okay. think so. All right, so we have quite a few more hands uh, raised, so I'll take a, a, a couple more. Um, let's go to a woman. We want to hear more women and youth. Uh, Paul Matibe, please let's keep it short. Sure. Thank you very much, Violet. Um, I, I, I'm very glad that you brought up the issue of what specifically is the catalyst uh, that will bring about this uh, change desired for Zimbabweans. I want to pinpoint just three very specific things and, uh, and challenge the international community and indeed the ambassadors that we have here on, on, on this meeting at the moment. I think what's needed in terms of uh, actors from outside the country in the international community is to see um, them work with their allies. I think that that is one thing that would certainly, certainly help. So um, the key question for them uh, that has emerged is, does the COVID-19 crisis enhance Mnangagwa survival? And we've seen that very evidently what is, what is taking place right now. And will the international community have the conviction, the conviction to be the impactful partners of democracy that millions of Democrats, Mambuans, uh, and, and as diaspora certainly want. I think that they need to work together with the United States and the EU. These countries with their allies need to work together. I think that the, you will hear a lot of sanctions uh, talk and narratives going on. This is certainly not the time to let up and be lifting sanctions on Zimbabwe. It's not the only tool, but there are many, many tools within these diplomatic missions toolboxes. These countries have a lot of tools. They need to be using those tools. We need to see their conviction. So three things. Zimbabweans do have the power to effectively tip the scales back in, in, in their favor and peaceful, disciplined, nonviolent protests are one way where the power which resides in the people can bring about change. Change does not only happen from the top down, change happens from the bottom, from the people up. The second point, pro-democracy, peaceful people, um, like I said, is, um, uh, is not always about can you beat someone who has the most guns, who has the most money. 
it, it is in fact true and has been proven time and time again by researchers and, and students of, of nonviolent protests that um, resistance uh, in, in, in the people can bring about change. Okay. So the international community, peaceful resistance can bring about this change and we need to deal with this leadership deficit at the helm in Zimbabwe. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I will take two more from the floor. Vusimu Sisibanda. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think we need to appreciate that the Zimbabwean problem is not just the Zimbabwean. To look at is that uh, we managed to dismantle you know, colonialism and apartheid because uh, the countries were working together as a collective to help each other overcome, you know, uh, the dictatorship that was brought by colonialism and apartheid. Now, at this particular stage, you'll realize that as long as we have got the AU that emphasizes a lot on not interfering with other countries, you will therefore realize that all these countries that we have are going to continue oppressing the people. That is why the problem that we have is seen in Malawi, in DRC, in Nigeria, in Cameroon, just across Africa. And um, secondly, if you look at our constitution, the Zimbabwean constitution, the new constitution, it, is, it looks more like the South African constitution in a way, but it is only so in form, but not in content, in the sense that all the most important institutions or provisions that would have allowed the people of Zimbabwe to fight for themselves on their own have been practically removed to such an extent that you know, the people do not have real power even when they go to court or when you look at, you know, the court themselves in, in terms of, you know, um, how we pick our judiciary and also the changes that we're having. So what we need to push for a system that will allow, you know, for example, you know, uh, the, 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 the practical implementation of the discussions that we're having now, rather than just to basically, you know, continue you know, talking and, and, and supporting, you know, any other movement or political party that comes, you know, with the agendas, but without the real, you know, uh, practical implementation of the change that the people of Zimbabwe require. What is the change that we are looking for? Is that one, the constitution that we're talking about or the constitutionalism that we need in Zimbabwe. Do we really see that constitutionalism being practically implemented using the current constitution that we have, where, for example, you know, we have allowed, um, you know, the government or the president to keep on changing, you know, uh, the constitution or bring in statutory instruments which are going to uh, govern the country. So I think that as we are here, maybe we need to talk about, you know, to, to have a self-introspection and say, let us reassess our position and say, are we in a position to really change you know, the status quo in the country for the benefit of the ordinary people, or we are only talking simply because, you know, we want to protect our own small interests and we don't care about what is happening with everybody else. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vusimusi. And um, the one last one from the floor for now, Naomi Chitambira. Can we unmute Na Naomi, please? Uh, Violet, thank you so much um, for, for, for picking me up. I should say I heard somebody talking and I feel as Zimbabweans what's missing is unity. We've been separated, uh, nail and truth, ZANPF has really made us um, people who do not support each other, we do not have a common goal and I think at the moment what we need as Zimbabweans is to come out of our shells and know that even if today you have money or you got a good life, the future of your children cannot be guaranteed in a country that's immoral or a government that's immoral that doesn't hold uh, or stand by anything. Whatever we have gathered today can actually disappear in the next five years. So I think if, if we get to manage to get out of those cocoons of ours, will be able to build a progressive movement towards continuing sensitizing the government. The other thing I also want to highlight, I get worried when people say we have to 
um, you know, tell a government that has failed, uh, we give it its reward or its package and it goes. It actually shows we as Zimbabweans are ready uh, to create a culture of awarding incompetence. If a government has failed, my take is down to let allow other people to come in and play. So we need to do away with the thing of Mugabe failed dismally with what we are seeing. This is what the president did with his team. He was rewarded. And now we're talking about this failed government. We're still talking around ideas of rewarding them for failing us and failing the future generations. I do really, I think we need to do away with that mentality. And uh, thirdly, I think every Zimbabwean in every corner um, or corner of the world should just come out and stand uh, with each other, you know, get courage over fear. That's what we need. At the moment, we need a leadership that helps us as people to get courage over fear, you know. Okay. Yeah, because so we're afraid. Just, just, I just, um, out of interest, um, uh, Naomi, I wanted to find out what about this issue uh, of the NTA? It would be interesting to hear from the floor what uh, people actually think about this proposal. What do you make of it, especially with what uh, the panelists have said so far? What do you make of this whole issue of the NTA? Well, do you I think suppose the way NTA forward? Is a transitional authority. The violet, that can really be, an, in, for me, basically, if the National Transitional Authority is not politicized, but involving technical people who really, really care about Zimbabwe, a National Transitional Authority at the moment that will help Zimbabwe move forward should not be politicized. It should not include anyone who's been in politics, but anyone who's got the qualities to build the institutions that will take Zimbabwe forward and all those that have been ripped of their capacity to act in their, on their mandate. So at the moment, I would say any political figure should not be included in national transitional authority because what we want is to depoliticize our country. If I can share, Violet, I was afraid to, to even share a Twitter that, that shows my concern about my country, that tells you the degree of how we as citizens, just general citizens, have been politicized and have been, you know, fear has been grafted. I think we've been grafted into fear. So, but um, I think we, we can move forward with the National Transitional Authority. Okay. That has got people we trust. They've got our best interests at heart, not politicians. Uh, thank you. Let me actually um, uh, get a few more from the floor because it will be interesting just to hear from just uh, citizens and not just uh, the elite uh, 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 panel. Um, I think we have... Um, uh, Dr. Limukani Mate, uh, can you come in? Can you uh, can you be specific though and tell us your thoughts about this proposal for an NTA? What do you make of that, Limukani? Okay, okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thanks, Violet. Uh, I, I think uh, it's unfortunate that we are having this discussion without without ZANPF involved. Uh, it's unfortunate that Mate Madema is not here because only uh, Zenegam was was talking. But he was expelled from Zanpiof because of his dissent, dissenting voice. You see, that's the system that we are dealing with. That those who have got dissenting voices are being expelled. So how do you deal with such a system? So my point is, is MDC, when MDC was in the government in 2013, it was supposed to work on in inclusive, inclusivity. In, in, inclus inclus there, there was supposed to be a government of, of an inclusive government, making sure that uh, uh, the constitution is, is, is changed or is amended to, to, to include other voices into the government. For example, uh, there is, for example, we can say that the president might be from another party. Then the second winner is from another party, becomes the vice president. By so doing, you find that we are, we are dealing or we are, we are, we are depoliticizing or, or we, are, we are dissolving uh, tox toxicity in the country. By so doing, then you find that we are, we are now uh, uh, bringing in other people or into the government. But unfortunately, Zanpiov does not want to work with anyone. Sanpiof is not willing to work with anyone. Hence, we're having this, this discussion is rhetoric. It's a rhetoric discussion. There is no Zanpiof. 
some so, people cannot so hear. What about specifically? We understand that, and we've already mentioned why Zanu PF is not here. They were invited, but unfortunately, um, they, they 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 didn't. Um, uh, they, they're not they, they're not available but what about the issue of the nta what are your thoughts on that do you think that is a way forward for zimbabwe yes yeah right. it might be a way forward for zimbabwe but is zanpf winning that's the point that's that's the first question is zanpf winning we are, we are having problems in the country because of zanpf you see we have got a general populace we have got a, a, a diverse of perspectives we have got diverse of academics we have got a diverse of, of uh, the youth but, but is ZANPF willing, those people who are in the power, at that clique, those, uh, that clique that were in the power, Mnangagwa, is Chiwenga willing? That's the point. So how do we go from here? That's the problem. Very good question. Um, uh, let me actually go to Dr. Shingimunyeza and, and, and get his response uh, to this to find out what does he think about this and also include um, Natai Mujuru's question about how do you get to an NTA? Is the current regime going to relinquish a power to an NTA. Um, Pastor Munyeza. Can we unmute? Pastor Munyeza. Yes, I'm back. Okay. So can you respond to, the, to, to that question? Because a lot of people are saying this could be just a talk shop. You know, we can say what we really want to happen, but at the end of the day, how do we get ZANU PF to also be on board? And would they just relinquish power because the majority of the people here have said this is the way forward, that we should have some kind of uh, uh, national dialogue or even have an NTA? What can you say about that? Yeah, um, it goes back to my presentation, which was uh, quite uh, vehemently resisted my roles that I play. Because at the end of the day, if we want to build a one Zimbabwe, we must recognize everybody as a player. Whether their role is to say, well, I did wrong, but am I accepted going forward? Our problem, that's why I emphasize the issue of healing, truth, and reconciliation. Violet, without that, this country can move forward. And you cannot do it without ZANU PF, MDC, civil society, business, and everybody else. You cannot do that. We are making a big mistake where we are so angry and hurting. And that if I were to say here today, that's why for me, and I, I want to put this, uh, expose myself here. Being in park and be able to criticize the government shows that there must be a place in this country where democracy actually is embedded and that my rights are also expected. Now, I have a backlash on a platform like this where people say I must leave. And I'm saying, where is democracy now? Is that an illegal act? If it is illegal, then I must be tried for being in park. It also means that we are hurting so much that we are so polarized. So at some point, we need to actually bring everybody together, ZANU-PF, MDC, the other parties, and then civic society. Now, if we don't have that move, uh, whatever change happens, it will be similar to November 2017. Mm. Whatever we do. Zenzo, okay, sorry, go on. So if we have to do that, we've got to bring, bring uh, ZANU-PF to the table. Now, some people will say, look, how do you bring ZANU-PF to the table? How do you bring MDC to the same table with ZANU-PF? We are actually getting there, Violet. And, and I'm just trying to be very uh, uh, casual about it because I think it's going to be bad. We are going to get to a place where there is a mutually hating stalemate that none of us has a choice but to now start talking to each other. That day is coming slowly but surely. So how is it going to be brought about? When we all can't eat, when we all can't um, help ourselves, when we all can't be protected, we will bring everybody to the table willingly so there won't be uh, one person calling for it. Because right now, the debate is who's going to call, uh, let's talk about this NTA, 
Who's going to call for the NTA? Who, who, whose mandate do they have? No. My view is that no one is going to call for the NTA if it is going to be the NTA. What I know is that everybody is going to have to come to the table and we all discuss because they, we won't be able to move to the next day. It's there. I mean, the, the signs are already there. Another two weeks, three weeks, one month. I know people keep saying, well, we have said that five years ago, look at where we are. Let me tell you, we never had COVID. We didn't have two years in succession of drought. We don't have an economy badly run by this system um, the way it has been. Even under Mugabe, this economy has never been this bad. And the world is not coming out to help us. There's no globe out there trying to chip in and say, look, plus, let's try and help. Once there is need, the, the, the monies for COVID are over, the coffers are empty. We need to know that. But we need to practice to talk to one another as Zimbabweans. Now, the problem is we still say this one is evil. Yes, there are people who have done horrible things, but they must be brought to the table so that we start with reconciliation, healing truth. Truth must be the centerpiece. Uh, Dr. Mies, I guess just a last question with, uh, for you on this one. Um, Ralph from, from the States has just sent a message saying, so Dr. Mies is suggesting that we must wait for people to starve to come together and then talk. So why, just, so why talk, just wait? That's what he's asking. Well, I'm not saying that. It is the tone of our conversations up until now. They are very much toxic. It just means that we're not ready. I'll use another allegory because I'm a preacher. When a man is drowning, you don't quickly rescue them because they'll drown you too. You wait for them until they're gasping so that you can rescue them properly. So this is probably where we need to. We still have a lot of fight in us to oppose each other as Zimbabweans. And maybe we need to exhaust that first until we realize that we need each other. But in order to need each other, we need to go through a healing process, which has to go through a truth. People must be able to say, I killed, I was, my relative was killed, you stole, I didn't steal, you, you defrauded, you corrupted. We must go through those motions. We can't build a country just by saying, look, let bygones be bygones. We cannot do a bygones be bygones. Okay. We have to. We have to actually start from that. That's why a cooling off period violet is important. And that's why some of the principles of the NTA are, are, are admired, at least from my angle. But it is because some of it can end up becoming politically uh, contentious and people stay, take forever arguing about that. The church came with something similar, which is the Sabbath, which I endorse because I'm coming from the church. So there are similar models we can work with right now. And I'm not waiting for the collapse but we need to change our attitude as we engage. So, so let's, let's, let's bring in uh, Reverend Mutata to, to, to respond to what you, you've just said. Uh, Reverend Mutata, are you, are you still online and following what is happening right now? Yes, I, I'm, I'm here, Violet. Can, can you, what's your response to what um, uh, Pastor Muniz has been uh, saying? I think uh, the, the, sometimes people have uh, been stuck in talking about the structure, the National Transitional Authority as a structure. And I think if we do that, we miss the point. The idea is not to deliberate on the structure, but to deliberate on the significance. Why, why do we need a national transitional process? It's because we are the, the, level, the distance uh, between Zimbabweans, the gulf between Zimbabweans is too big. They are, they, the differences are so entrenched and the levels of hate and hatred is so deep. The wounds are still festering. So the reason why you need uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Mieza is calling the, uh, the, the cooling period uh, or what others are calling the transitional period is to allow Zimbabweans to build structures that allow uh, for the nation to find each other, to establish institutions that constitute a state, so that the judges, the courts, the police become independent of political uh, uh, influence, uh, so that we, the people who are hungry 
are, are fed so that they are able to make decisions not with their stomach, but with their minds. So that the constitution is in place so that it becomes the basis for public engagement and not political affiliation. It is only when we have built this period that allows for the nation to heal itself and re-establish a proper democratic dispensation that we can allow people to enter into competitive democracy, that people can vote for whoever they want without coercion and without fear that someone is going to knock on their door and threaten them. We are not there yet. Even if we want to go for an election in 2023, we can get there, but we are never, we can go to election in 2028. The nation is not yet prepared for a free and fair election, whoever is going to run this country, because the chasm between Zimbabweans is too big. Briefly, how do you respond to Keith Busimani, who says the NTA is a bad idea. It will have the effect of sanitizing the thieves in Zonu PF. I'm not talking about the NTA, I'm talking about the transitional period. Whatever structure that is going to come, as I agree with uh, Dr. Mieza, what the, the structure must be defined by the process of engagement. And that's why we have defined this engagement, these dialogue processes must happen at three levels. At the grassroots level, it must be to educate citizens to reclaim their agency and to alert them to the fact that they must be custodians of the change. At the level of organized society, it must be to find how do we build agenda setting and find convergence among uh, opinion leaders. And at the political level, we must be able to say, how do we build consensus? How do we able to coexist within our political differences? At the moment, the kind of political arrangements we have it's an exclusive imagination of the future. If you are ZANU-PF, you need to find a way of relinquish all forms of opposition. If you are opposition, you are imagining a future where ZANU-PF doesn't exist. But unfortunately, that future doesn't exist because there is no way we are going to have a time when we have no opposition. And there is no way where ZANU-PF is completely going to be eradicated. What we need is a future, the near future we need is a future we will need some kind of uh, coexistent, co coexistence, and that need to be midwived. That future is not going to come through a winner takes all organized through elections. It, will, it needs to be midwived, and we need a buffer zone to allow uh, true competitive politics uh, to take course when, when the environment allows. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm just looking at the chats in Zoom and quite a few people are also talking about the diaspora. I don't know, is Eleanor Sisulu from South Africa, is, is she online? So we can get her thoughts on that. In, in, in the meantime, maybe let me bring Sipo Malunga. Can you come back online so that uh, we could hear your thoughts on the issue of the diaspora and how um, they can contribute to the way forward. Thank you, uh, Violet. Uh, you asked me a question that I, I, uh, I'm happy to answer, but I wanted to just say something about how do we will Zanu PF relinquish power? Hell no, they won't. Why would they? I wouldn't if I were them. Uh, obviously, Mnangagwa is not Gorbachev. He doesn't have to contend with the pressures that the Soviet Union was contending with in 1990, 1989. Um, we have already conceded that the purpose of running the country is personal benefit. So there's going to have to be a fight. I have no problem with the NTA, but the NTA is only after. I completely get the, 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 the clergyman saying people need to come together. I agree. I've worked for many years as a conflict uh, 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 prevention expert in the UN, and I, I do not like conflict. I believe people should avoid it. Um, but I believe that people need to manifest their own power in a peaceful way and take back control of the state, which has been, which has been taken over by this small elite. Uh, how that happens, nobody knows. It doesn't even need a political party. 
none of the revolutions, the peaceful people powered revolutions have involved any political party. So we are restricting ourselves to a conversation between MDC, ZANU-PF, none of them matter in the schematics. Ultimately, the people will have to lead this revolution. Anyway, your point, have I, Violet, I can't hear you. Uh, I see, see, Paul, you're saying ultimately the people have to lead, but this crisis has been going on for 20 years now. Well, it's going to happen, I, don't you worry. Violet, let me, let me finish. What, what do the people need to do? For 30 years mm. Before the Tunisian people removed him. 30 years they were, he was in power. Kampoore, he killed Sakara and he was in power for another 20, 30 years. Bashir was in power for 30 years after taking over a coup. So for me, I, I haven't lost hope. I don't know when the people of Zimbabwe are going to wake up, but I know they will wake up at some point. And when they do, it won't matter whether ZANU-PF, the military, MDC, where anyone is won't matter. Because at that point, there's only going to be one thing and one thing alone. The people will be taking back control. What will then come afterwards? We will then all now start to run around and maybe we need an NTA, maybe we need this. It won't matter. Now, I do get the priest bringing us together now and saying, hang on, let's not let it get there. But that only works if you're talking to reasonable people. That only works if the politicians have a national interest at heart. If they don't, they will just allow everything to continue until it implodes. It's almost like we've seen this everywhere around the world. Politicians are so selfish that they don't give a damn until the people force them out. I would, I would believe, I would like to believe, because ZANU-PF before has had 1987 unity with ZAPU. They have had 2013, but they always fall back into a one party default mode, which means we should learn something. It means that we should learn that they are not capable of sharing power with anybody. Therefore, we need a completely new arrangement. That's what the people will deliver. One day, I don't know when, but when they do, I'm simply saying one thing. I hope that the coercive apparatus of ZANU-PF, which is the army, will take the side of the people. Other armies elsewhere around the world have done so, even if they have first tried to push back. They have come to their senses and then said, wait a minute, we are on the side of the people here. And when that happens, then we can have an NTA, then we can have all these other things. We're all on board. So I haven't a problem, I don't have a problem with an NTA. So that's my answer to the question. But it's only coming afterwards. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I guess, we, uh, uh, and, and briefly on the diaspora action. The diaspora all over the world, all the, the diaspora is a key critical element of any change in any country. Zimbabwe is sustained right now by the diaspora. Even just me as an example, I've been looking after my mother for the past 20 years. I've been looking after a whole range of extended family for 20 years. I'm subsidizing the government. When any of my relatives get sick, I pay for their medical aid. I pay for school fees for I don't know how many dozens of children. Why should I do that? So I have a, a, a fundamental interest in what is going on in Zimbabwe. I don't want to be here in South Africa. I want to come back home. I would like to work for my government. I've been serving all over the world, working for all sorts of governments, trying to save all sorts of countries. I want to come back home. And I believe that the diaspora should continue to be involved because they, if anything, have a huge stake in our country. So, and I believe they all want to get involved. And they should never allow anyone to tell them, oh, you are not here, you don't know what's going on. Even when you get on social media, you say something, say, oh, you can talk, 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 come to the streets and lead. Who says I have to be there? How was the liberation struggle for Zimbabwe sustained? It was sustained by the diaspora. Where was ZANU-PF? Was it not in Mozambique in the diaspora? Where was ZAPU in Zambia in the diaspora? And then now somebody wants to tell you that as a diaspora, you've got no contribution to Zimbabwe. And I say, don't accept it. We all want change from wherever we are. Thank you. Okay, and then uh, briefly, I'll, I'll just go to uh, Godfrey uh, um, for his thoughts on these um, uh, last few comments. Uh, Godfrey, just briefly. Senagamu.
Yeah, 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 well, Violet, I thought you'd uh, give me enough time to to explain a little bit that rather than to say uh, briefly. Anyway, yeah. in trying to be in, in try, yeah, in trying to be brief, I would say, in terms of the way forward, this is what I I think has to happen. One, we have to constitute an inclusive and non-partisan citizens platform uh, that would be representing all critical stakeholders in, in our country. And then broaden that movement to become a mass driven movement that shall work on the modalities of the way forward. Two, to initiate real dialogue and engagement with the citizens first before seeking to engage a minority who are in leadership. Then three, unite the people and build national consensus on what has to be, to be done. And these nationwide consultations must then form the basis of what has to be done. If, uh, if the 2,400 people I've referred to uh, who are in leadership are a minority, then obviously the 20 or plus or minus 20 people who are here can obviously not decide on behalf of uh, all, all, all Zimbabweans. So we must then seek the views and opinion of the people and where necessary, educate them on what is transpiring in order to come up with a position. Then fourth, engage all key and strategic institutions in the country in order to sell the idea and clear out any suspicions because there is a lot of mistrust in this country and no one must be left out in this process, including uh, touts, uh, traditional leaders, the diaspora, the disabled, uh, youth, women, the vendors, security, war vets, labor, minors, students, academia, civil society, and everyone. Before we even think of engaging uh, the diplomatic community, the ambassadors and everyone, it must be a Zimbabwean affair because we are the ones who are being, uh, who are facing these issues. Then the fifth point is uh, avoiding unnecessary confrontation that violate is not a sign of cowardice. Compromises are inevitable. It is, is it not possible, Violet, that an argument or war can be won without fist fighting, firing a single bullet, or even shedding a, a single drop of blood? If it is possible, why avoid that route? Confrontations and war situations, in my view, have no guaranteed winner. In the end of it all, Zimbabwe must be the winner. Not a party, not an individual, but the people. And if the idea to push for an NTA is to come, let it come from the people. Let the people own the idea, and by so doing, we'll be restoring the people's power that has been stolen by a few crooks and opportunities. However, if the other side proves too hard to cooperate, then we'll, there will be no option but to speak the language. They quickly understand. And it will be very, very unfortunate, Violet, that uh, no one knows of the outcome of that, that route. And, and lastly, Violet, is on, on, uh, as a young person, we, 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 have, we have already started an initiative to come up with a grassroots and citizens movement that has already started the ball rolling in pushing for an economic revolution that seeks to confront and eradicate corruption, fight related economic injustices, and ensure broad-based empowerment rather than to rely on, 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 a few, on a few politicians. So all that I can say is let's have this engagement in dialogue with the citizens first. And, and there is always plan B and plan C if uh, plan A Plan A fails. This is what, what, what I think. And my, my last appeal is, my, my last appeal, Violet, is maybe uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of ZANU PF because I'm out of ZANU PF, but I would want uh, the next conversation, the next engagement to include more young people because you can't have people uh, who won't be part of that future gathered here to discuss a future which they are not going to be part of. Engage more young people from across the political divide so that they take charge and take ownership of the process. Thank you. Definitely. That's a, a fair point there. Um, I understand that um, Eleanor Sisulu is, 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 is online. Um, Eleanor Sisulu is a civic leader, uh, Zim, Zimbabwean uh, based in, in, in South Africa. Eleanor, how do you get Zimbabweans to act and contribute to change? Are there any lessons that we can learn from South Africa given our current situation? Well, Violet, I think one thing that has disturbed me about this conversation is that there is no sense of pan-Africanism. I think we need an injection of pan-Africanism for one. The abuses that African governments meet on their citizens, from South Africa to Cairo, 
it's something that we need to be conscious of because if we want solidarity from people, we also need to give other people solidarity. And I, I, there's a very good article that uh, an Ethiopian wrote about African governments um, showing solidarity with African Americans about George Floyd issue, but at the same time having to carrying out those same abuses for themselves. So uh, the, the, the abuse of security forces on African people throughout this continent is something that must be acknowledged by Zimbabweans. The next thing is that we need to feel outrage. You know, this thing of talking and healing and reconciliation, it did not work in 2008. It did not work. People sat and made a political accommodation. Political accommodation will not work unless you have fought, got the levers of impunity. As long as Zimbabweans can be beaten and abused on a daily basis, um, it's going to be very difficult to sit and talk about reconciliation. So I think the human rights, and I feel the human rights ball was dropped with the GNU, which was a big mistake. Even while the politicians had accommodated among themselves, that fight for human rights, that fight against abusers of each and every Zimbabwean should have continued. A young man was shot in Bulawayo uh, what, last week, two weeks ago, Paul Munokopa. There's been no outrage. One doesn't get the sense of anger. It's as if people accept that the police can just come and shoot him. So and what is the way forward then, um, the Eleanor? Well, I think the way forward is not one thing. It's many battles on many fronts. Then the people who fight on the political front with their political parties, and that's fine. Those of us in the diaspora will, will show solidarity where we can and raise our voices about human rights abuses. That must continue. But I think the work that human rights organizations have done in Zimbabwe have done very important and good work which must continue, and that is documenting abuses all the time and having specific campaigns. For example, this issue of abduction, there really needs to be a major strategically thought out campaign against this issue of, uh, um, of abduction. We need to drive up the cost of human rights abuses. We need to make sure that there's media spotlight on this. And we need to learn, you know, with we saw with George Floyd, this thing was going on a long time. Somehow that George Floyd video provided the tipping point. There will be a tipping point. And, and I think when you talk about NTA, I agree with Sipo. NTA can happen, but it must happen after somehow we have worked out how to strip ZANU PF of its power. And we need to, a conversation needs to be, what is it that enables these people to hold on to power in this way? And one, we know it's the media, their control of the media, their control of radio. I mean, in South Africa, uh, and the control of the judiciary, the uh, human rights abuses. In South Africa, it would not have been possible to get rid of Jacob Zuma without the judiciary and without the media. And, 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 and the, of course, it's the people, but the, the media helps the people to organize. And so, it's, it's about organizing and strategizing, but those ingredients, and to me, the ingredients of always fighting human rights abuses, regardless of which political party is there. But also, I think it's unacceptable to talk about, oh, the two sides must talk, because it's like a husband abusing his wife. He beats the hell out of his wife day in and day out. He beats his children, he bullies them. And then family members come say, oh, let's sit down, let's agree, let's talk, there must be unity in this family. Let's not fight, for, unity is not the issue. We're not united, but we know we must fight for what is right and we must fight for relief for people today. Not tomorrow, not next week, you can have those long-term okay. political conversations, but people's rights must be fought for today. Thank you. Thank you. Now, before I go to um, Tony, Rila, and Ibo with their last uh, comments, um, Dr. Shingi Munyeza just sent me a message to say he has a comment, a, sh a brief comment to make on the process towards the transitional uh, period. So, Wamunyeza, can you come in, please? And can you make it? Yes, yes, yes. Um, very quickly, um, 
the, 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 like I said, the transitional period has to be, it has to have a soft landing. Um, when you look at what happened in Libya, in Tunisia, in, in Sudan, and all those places where the citizens uh, kind of came up, they, there is some level of destruction that comes with it if there is no real soft landing. And I think that we must find some lessons there so that to, to ensure that the citizens actually get the power and determine their course. If we don't have a softer landing, and that softer landing has to have some kind of international regional support. Um, this idea of that, that saying, look, we will do it alone, it won't happen. Because if we do it alone, the power will still reside in the ones who already have power. So we need to have some kind of an, an underwriter, and we need to have some kind of um, a, a midwife that will make sure that we do not end up the citizens marginalized again, almost back to 2017. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks, Violet. Um, and Gladys Slashwire from the MDC. Thank you. So, can you hear me, Violet? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to say, um, you know, having listened to the conversation, I just wanted to say, we, I think as Zimbabweans, we need to stop working in silos. Uh, we need to understand that divided we fall and you know, united we stand. I was just listening to the equalization, I mean, in terms of um, um, ZANU PF and MDC. And I think, you know, uh, in all fairness, we need to understand that, you know, the MDC Alliance is really under great pressure from, um, you know, ZANU PF. If you look at how our leaders have been assaulted, how our leaders have been targeted for arrest, how our leaders have been, you know, abducted, sexually assaulted, and, and, and everything. So I think in our equalization, we also need to be, you know, to, to really look at what is happening and make a fair assessment. Um, um, so we need to work together. We need to stop agonizing and start organizing. And um, just making reference to the discussion, you know, on uh, the National Transitional Authority, I just wanted to say because when I got a chance, I didn't get a chance to finish my points. And I just wanted to say the MDC fully subscribes uh, to the notion of uh, a national transitional mechanism because we need a mechanism, uh, an implementing mechanism for comprehensive reforms, looking at electoral reforms, looking at media reforms, looking at security sector reform, institutional reforms, uh, um, in light of the party state conflation that we find ourselves in um, uh, as Zimbabweans. So we need that, mechanisms, uh, that mechanism to be able to implement reforms to make sure that the next election will not be a disputed election like the elections that we have seen uh, in Zimbabwe um, you know, in the past. So I just thought it, it's, it's important for me to, to, to highlight that, that, that point that the MDC fully subscribes to the national transitional mechanism. And in our reload, we don't unpack I mean, in terms of the details of the national uh, transitional mechanism, because we think this is something that Zimbabweans, you know, in our diversity and, um, you know, the, the various stakeholders must be able to agree on what kind of a mechanism that will be. Um, but we fully subscribe uh, to, to, to the cooling period and um, um, to the national transitional mechanism. Okay, thank you, uh, Gladys. Um, if you allow me, there, there are quite a, a, a number of uh, people um, who want to speak. So I'm going to allow a few more, um, and then we'll end uh, with um, uh, Tony Rila and uh, Ibo Mandaza, the organizers of this event. So let me start with, um, because there are quite a few who have raised their hands, please make it short so that we can try and have as many people who are left to speak. Um, just make it less than a minute and a half each. Um, Charles Joao. Can you make it brief, please? Charles Joao. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Violet. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people have said a lot here, but I do agree with the C4 and Dr. Maniga's sentiments. We may talk and talk and talk and talk, especially right now. I'm seeing that what we are talking is uh, what should come out of a crisis. But do you realize that uh, the condition which is needed for us 
to go for a national transition authority or whichever uh, name you can give it. It's not yet there. Uh, I think, as uh, Sifo has said, people should rise and claim that our rights are being violated. Without people rising, thinking that you can convince Zampia by these meetings or just talking like this, you, we are just joking, for sure. What is needed is to find a way of making sure that people rise. If people rise, these people may understand. I was listening to Patrick Jinamasa this other day. You are saying that uh, responding to um, uh, this other uh, journalist, Mshanga, this other day, you are saying that, uh, you know what, uh, we have full confidence in this leadership. So these people are living in denial. They are not understanding that people are suffering, or they may understand it, but what they want is uh, just lining their pockets. They are looting these people. And look at it, are they reserving these monies in the banks in Zimbabwe or in the accounts in Zimbabwe? No, they're stashing all these monies outside the country, on overseas markets. That on its own can tell you that these people will continue on this spree until or only if citizens rise. Without citizens rise, we are saying nothing. And this thing you are talking of national transition should just come after people is the reason. And these people have, have just accepted that for sure we have failed and people have reason. Without people rising, never expect people that uh, these people are going to just to say, example, they're going to say, for sure, we're going to surrender power. Never. And I can tell you, that's my own thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, next, Bright, Brighton Mutevuka. Thank you, Violet. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Right. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, well, what I will say very quickly is that I, um, I agree with uh, Sipo as well. I um, have heard uh, quite a lot of things that have been said today. And what's fundamental, really, is that um, nothing can come. We have to understand you know, what this regime is about. There is clearly an intention to use fear as an instrument to stop people from um, you know, removing the regime from power. That, that, that is ultimately the objective of the use of fear. Now, ultimately, as we move forward, we have to realize that there have been missed opportunities and those missed opportunities revolve around, for me, the period coming after 2008, uh, which resulted in the um, uh, government of national unity. And then the second uh, opportunity that presented itself was um, effectively um, the period following uh, the fall of Robert Mugabe. Those were opportunities that were missed. So as far as I'm concerned, the opportunities for change lie in um, either taking advantage of um, those opportunities, those windows, or uh, effectively exposing uh, rigging when it occurs. But change and freedom comes from demanding it, and people have to be willing to overcome the fear before that happens. And uh, my assessment of um, the current situation is that we're not very far off uh, from an implosion. So an implosion is very much around the corner as okay. far as we're concerned. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, briefly, Brighton Chireka, can we just make it very short because we have to be finished by uh, eight o'clock. So uh, Brighton Chireka, a brief, brief comment. Uh, thank you very much, Violet. I uh, just want to say that um, thanks very much for the contribution that we have heard from everyone. But I think one thing that is uh, missing in the discussion is that um, we know that political parties succeed due to leadership, but also we mustn't forget about followership. Sadly, we don't talk much about followership. Uh, I see a lot of us are alienated and we just criticize and do nothing. But um, I know something maybe has uh, turned us off, but um, also we have put on the other end, the yes people that do sing for their supper that they also like to follow everything. But I think what we now need is um, to educate one another so that we become effective followers. We think on, in a, um, for ourselves, critical thinking, openly disagreeing with our leadership and also not in, in, to be intimidated by hierarchy or political structures. For example, even in the army, people should not follow blindly um, uh, instructions where they will kill other people. So that I think if we work on that, then we can have a good followership. But what we are having at the moment, we are having followership that is yes people and then our leaders get away with murder. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. Fungai Jura. Hi, hi, thank you, Violet. Um, I just wanted to make a, a very quick uh, contribution. Uh, firstly, with respect to the NTA talk, um, I think anyone who has been involved in conflict resolution knows that uh, whenever you have one party within the conflict that is all the power, uh, there's no point in trying to come up with uh, uh, any form of dialogue. Uh, in this case, with ZANU-PF, uh, we have the support of the army. Uh, and, and, and in the same way that in 2008 and in 2013, when they withdrew from uh, the, the GNU, they have all the power. So what exactly is the point of trying to negotiate with someone with all the power? Obviously, even if you come up with an NTA, it's always going to favor the one with the most power. So until ZANU-PF is divorced from the army, there's no point in us wasting our time talking about the NTA. The key thing is to divorce the army from the PF. Uh, the second thing, um, and the last thing as well, is that I think we need to be students of history. Okay, um, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, you will find that uh, even, even, even with respect to our current junta, there's been examples, for example, Chile, that had a junta, and how was that junta toppled? Among other things, there was a lot of pressure from the Catholic Church. And I think Zimbabwe, being a majority Christian nation, I think it's very important for the church to know its place and to understand its power. We had Ivan Mawarire who was able to organize uh, this flag and made a, a, a lot of noise, but unfortunately the church wasn't able to take that up and really push uh, 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 the change that was necessary. So I think the church is really letting the, the, the country down and it needs to take its place as opposed to trying to uh, be it uh, cozy up with uh, the regime. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll, um, we'll, we'll, let's hear from uh, Dr. Noah Manika with the last word. Violet, um, I, I, I thought I shouldn't leave without saying uh, this real briefly. I think when we talk about toxicity, a lot of times we end up creating the impression that Zimbabwean people are violent. Zimbabwean people are not violent. We know who the people who are violent are. So when we talk about having these difficult conversations with our people, we're talking about empowering the people to rise up in strength, not to do anything illegal. I wish Matema Ganda was here because the only people who have given us a precedent for military action, which is constitutional, is Zanupia. They said it was not a coup. They actually removed somebody. They no longer would accept being the wall of protection around Robert Mugabe, and they said it was constitutional. And it's time though, now for us to say to our people, make sure you can have some of these conversations with your friends, with your relatives, and don't be afraid. And lastly, uh, Violet, I think it's very, very important for us, as I said earlier, that we have all been complicit. The, the biggest problem when something happens, and it's now gotten to the point where it is, is even the church uh, pretending, and I'm a person of faith, pretending that it has ever been on the forefront of this struggle. No, the church hasn't. And I think it's very, very important. I really love the fact that there are some people who are in the church who are beginning to rise up and saying some things which should have always been the voice of the church right from the beginning. There are people who are church leaders, very, very strategic, strategic church leaders, who say that Idim Nangagwa was chosen by God. And, and, you know, it's, it's that kind of hypocrisy that makes it difficult sometimes to let you say, well, the church is the one that should be leading uh, some of these things. We, everybody, should be leading this process. And it is high time we had these difficult conversations with our own relatives, with your child, with your pastor, with someone in the, lastly, real quick, I always say this, even when I come in uh, to the country, when I've been traveling and I'm uh, accosted by members of the infamous CIO, I always tell those people, because a lot of them are much, much younger than me. And I say, look, if anyone instructs you to shed blood, it's on you. It's not on the people who have given you the instruction to. And it's high time we had those conversations. Okay, thank you. Final words from the Swiss ambassador. Yes, thank you very much. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. I get the picture, yeah. Thank you very much. No, indeed, I, I think this uh, discussion uh, has been very, very broad and very, very interesting. Why do I say broad? I think 
broad, it, it reflects all the different opinions and currency we, we are assisting and it helps a lot, I think, at least to me as an international observer, it helps a lot to understand where could lie a consensus in the analysis and in the way forward uh, under the actual crisis. And I would very much thank you for this opportunity. And second, when I say interesting, it is because it shows that this broad discussion also has many, many challenges. It has the challenges of, uh, of many of the interveners who have already a set goal. And at the same time, it has the challenges of how to avoid a fixed goal and being flexible on the different approaches. So from my side, thank you very much. And I think Switzerland, who has here a very diversified interest in this country and, and as a neutral country, I think we, with many others, have an interest to, to, having, to see a success of uh, this discussion and that it will lead to something very fruitful for the future of Zimbabwe. Thank you very much. Thank you. A final word from the EU ambassador. Oh, sorry, I, I lost the discussion for a while. I was uh, dropped out and then it was, um, took some time for me to come back. But no, uh, just a word of thanks for everyone. It was been uh, really interesting. Um, and I very much value the forum that uh, the SAP has um, put at our disposal for exchange of views and, uh, and uh, very much appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I will uh, then would like to hear from uh, Tony Rila. I don't see him. Is he online? I hope he's online. Um, uh, uh, Tony, uh, final words from the Platform for Concerned uh, Citizen. Is Tony Thank you, Violet. Uh, I hope you can see me and hear me. You were complaining yesterday. We, can, we, we can't see you, but we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, let me, let me. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we can see you now. Okay. All right. Firstly, apologies to all the youth for elderliness. Uh, and to reiterate why we came here today from the PCC, from the Platform of Concerned Citizens, and SAPIS. Thank you, SAPIS. Uh, the aim was to focus on what to do now. Um, and this discussion has ranged over a very, 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 very wide range of the problems we face um, and the difficulties behind those problems and the issues that it raises. As a rapporteur in such a discussion, it is extremely difficult. I've been sitting here scribbling notes like crazy trying to capture the richness of this discussion. And I think that what I'm hearing overall, and of course, as a rapporteur, you have to draw broad lines. I think across the board, people were talking about the need to talk. I think I heard that from Shingi. I think I heard that from Kenneth. I think I heard it from people on the side, the idea that we need to be talking to each other. Um, I think that's really critical. Most see the need for some kind of conversation going forward. And people raised some of the issues, that the blockages to that, the control of the media space and the difficulties that people face in talking to each other. And people raised the issue of trust that political trust, personal trust, is a very, very scarce commodity in Zimbabwe. And they link that to fear. And these are all really very, very important issues. But nonetheless, they talked about the need for national dialogue. And I think that uh, Kenneth Mutata pointed out the whole basis behind the National Convergence Platform and the need to bring people together in a national dialogue. And I heard that supported by lots of different people. There was also the issue of political settlement. Um, the political problems of Zimbabwe are immense. And 
most of us, uh, I heard today, are skeptic about the possibility that we can bring people together on a platform, the political players, that is, the political parties, the government, the opposition, together to begin to discuss a way forward. Um, and I think it was important that Brian pointed out, Brian Raptopoulos pointed out, that this sometimes takes external push. That certainly was the case for the older people who can remember behind Lancaster House and why we came together in the end. The region finally decided that it was necessary that people came together. So the issue of uh, bringing us together uh, needs some kind of external push from the region, but from the international community, and it needs them obviously to be in concert about the need to do that. It's not going to be easy. Brian pointed it out. Eleanor pointed it out that, you know, we need some kind of pan-Africanist notion that what happens in a neighbor's back garden affects us as much as it affects anybody else. Uh, I didn't hear anybody talk about uh, elite pacts. What I heard was a massive rejection of elite pacts. And that's what we've had since 1980. We've had a series of elite pacts. And almost everybody I heard said no to an elite pact. And then there was the issue of transitional arrangements or the NTA or whatever you want to call it. And many people basically, I think, seeing it as an end stage which quite clearly it is. A national transitional authority follows processes that come before that. And so I heard the notion that Zimbabwe needs a transformist, reformist uh, notion going forward. Uh, that's, I heard, had traction. The idea that we need to be in something that will take us to a new place. As Kenneth talked about it, something that will generate a new social contract, redesign the games of the rural, of, 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 of politics, the game of politics. So it, it seems to me very clear that this can only be the beginning of a conversation. This is not the conversation that generates uh, a conclusion or a clear way forward. I did hear that, uh, Many people are stuck with trying to understand the depth and the breadth of the problems that we face, and they are enormous. Um, so we will need many conversations uh, going forward. One could hope, and the PCC hopes, that this will lead eventually to some kind of national conference. I want to say that um, from the PCC at any rate, because um, we're part of the hosts of this thing, that this has been a long journey. This journey began in 2016 with the, the blunt conversation that we needed a soft landing. Shing, Shingi Munyeza talked about a soft landing. We were talking in 2016 about a soft landing. Um, Tony, you have one minute left. Okay. So I think it's very clear, just to restate some things that Ibo said at the beginning. Uh, what we believe is needed, and these are open questions. It seems clear that what is necessary are mediated negotiations between political parties leading to a political settlement. And we stress mediation in the way that other people have talked about them. And in parallel, a national dialogue of the kind suggested by the NCP, with all stakeholders outside of the political parties, to determine what the social contract and the new rules of the game for politics should be. And then what is necessary is a mediated discussion between the political parties and the representatives of the national dialogue to determine 
the structure and function of the NTA. Okay. That's how you get to an NTA after this process. It's a long process before that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Unfortunately, I have to cut you now because cut you off because we're going to be offline in just a okay. minute. So thank you and thank you all for your, your frankness and your honesty and your wisdom. Thanks, thanks, Tony. Would like to end with thanking SAPES Trust for hosting this very important and much needed forum. Hopefully, it will form the springboard for further conversations on the way forward on Zimbabwe. And on that note, I want to just um, bring back the convener, Dr. Ibo Mandaza, for just uh, uh, concluding remarks. 20 seconds, Dr. Mandaza. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just three points before I thank everybody. The first is that uh, this is the first in the, in the conversation. Towards the second point, which, which Tony mentioned, namely, namely the idea of a national dialogue conference. And I think um, Kelton Tata mentioned it. So we, ne we need to time frame this, this, this series of conversations. And thirdly, there will be a report on this conversation tonight to form the basis for both the future conversations, but also the future the National Dialogue Conference. And therefore, my task is really to thank, first and foremost, a wonderful moderator, Violet, for sticking it out for almost two, more than two hours. It wasn't easy, but you, 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 you managed. If, if, if I, I can applaud. <laughs> uh, and secondly, uh, the panelists, uh, which has been, it's a wonderful technology, this really, to be seeing uh, SIPO, uh, Noah Manika in the US and so on. I'm, I'm simply amazed. But the panels were wonderful, all of them. I have to apologize again that we, we had problems uh, for Jonathan Moyo linking from Nairobi. Um, and Eleanor coming in late. I don't know what Eleanor was doing, but anyway, she came eventually. But I think uh, the the team that we brought together has done a good job for us. Uh, last but not least, the technical people, my son Robert upstairs there, done a good job. He was studying the Zoom, and I think he has acquitted himself very well. Uh, Michelle Akata for helping. And again, again, I must thank uh, Violet for really assisting us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we hope to see you soon in the next round. Thank you all. And thank you to all the listeners and viewers on Facebook and the Zoom chat.